Hi all, let's have a brief look at game eight of the World Chess Championship today. Magnus Carlsen playing white against Vichy. Kicks off with e4, a little bit of a surprise with e4. So on previous games there was knight f3, a couple of times in c4 in one game, so e4. Now, Nakamura once said, um, well, early in the year, that the opening you choose is kind of making a statement. So I was half expecting something like a f fighting Sicilian defense, uh, just just to show you know a statement made I'm going to try and really win this game and take risks but we see actually e5 which of course can lead to aggressive positions potentially in dynamic positions but after knight f3 knight c6 bishop b5 we get uh, the Berlin uh, defense knight f6 now white castled knight takes e4 and here there are some move choices the most common is d4 by a long shot to, to play d4 and get the dreaded kind of berlin wall so for example d4 knight d6 taking on c6 d takes d takes e5 knight f5 and we have this position which um my good friend paul georgiou in the live commentary is emphasizing he doesn't think this is at all bad for black so maybe it was a wide wise decision for magnus to sidestep this line and play a slightly rarer move uh, to play actually rook e1 so in terms of relative games actually there's over 4700 on live but with d4 and only 777 with rook e1 so it's you know quite a big game difference to play rook e1 we see knight d6 the most common move knight takes e5 and now of course we can't take here that would be a disaster because of knight takes c6 check and uh, discover check so theory uh, usually goes bishop e7 here an alternative is knight takes e7 but bishop e7 and um, sorry I mean knight takes e5 is the alternative in this position knight takes e5 is uh, and bishop e7 the two top moves so bishop e7 now the bishop goes to f1 knight takes e5 rook takes e5 and you'll see from this structure not only is it symmetrical which can lead to draws quite a lot of the time there's only one uh pull missing from both sides so everyone in the game is now just sharing uh the e file so it's like a french defense exchange variation unfortunately which has a very drawish reputation indeed let's see d4 bishop f6 the rook goes all the way back and rook e8 so not the most exciting game so far this next move looks fairly logical c3 because it's uh, trying to blunt that bishop which could also be supported with knight f5 so it's a bit too risky for white to try c4 there's no need for magnus colson playing uh, with white here to take any unnecessary risks he just wants a very solid position so in effect playing uh, what looks like an exchange french defense would seem like a very very good idea in principle just to close out the match and become the next chess world champion there aren't that many games in this match a 12 game match so it just needs to play solidly and perhaps coast with a series of draws if Vichy doesn't want to provide a fight now well he can play respectably which so far in this game is just respectable moves but it's not exactly fierce dynamic aggressive play rook takes e1 queen takes e1 i was half expecting queen e8 here but instead we see knight e8 bishop f4 d5 and it looks very much like an exchange french uh, structure bishop d3 is uh, a nice move because knight d2 uh, let's put on the kibitzer here anyway just to see the engine evaluation i would expect very very stable evaluations which don't change much in this sort of structure there aren't many surprises or twists and turns usually you'd expect from this kind of structure so if knight d2 bishop f5 intuitively looks like a good idea but it might not even be a big deal there's no real big deal about this position but bishop d3 takes away f5 from the c8 bishop so white has a, a small edge g6 which does weaken the dark squares a bit but it does provide either knight or bishop going to g7 if the knight comes to g7 then bishop f5 is supported which seems fairly logical and in fact we do see the knight coming to g7 now queen e2 which prepares 
it would seem in principle rook e1, but the knight also supports potentially a rook coming to e8 later once these pieces move. For the moment, we see c6, now rook e1. There's no entry points along the e file. Bishop f5, and now Magnus is happy to take off that bishop. Knight takes f5. Now what ha White has got in terms of a small edge, in particular is a, a grip now on this e5, and this e5 square can be used. And we see knight f3 here. Black has to tread a little bit ca uh, carefully here. He plays actually knight g7. Now bishop e5, exchanging off the dark square bishop will emphasize the potential weaknesses of the dark squares. Knight e6, and now white takes off the dark square bishop, and we see knight e5. And here there was a flurry of excitement in the live commentary today. The um, treble or triple commentary between myself, my good friend Alex Aflontis, and Paul Georgiou. A little bit of excitement after this next move, rook e8, as we examined the consequences of Magnus's knight g4, which actually threatens to do something with these dark square weaknesses, even in, in this simplified position. What is particularly interesting is a huge blunder, which won't be mentioned by engine views of this game, and it's actually quite intriguing how this loses. In the game Queen d8 was played, and here the moment of excitement began in our analysis with Queen g5. Because in fact, it seems, Queen g5, which in some respects seems quite an interesting move, as though maybe even um, knight, knight g7 is actually threatening, it seems, uh, to win a piece, you know, if taking on e1, then taking on g4. So it would seem quite an interesting move to pressurize the knight, to put a bit of pressure on the knight. But it's actually losing in this position. I wonder if you can spot the move which would seem to be absolutely winning for white if I gave you 10 seconds starting from now. Now this queen g5 obviously it wasn't actually played, but what would you play here with white? So you might want to pause the video, I'll give you 10 seconds starting now. Okay, the forcing move f4 is actually incredibly powerful here. Uh, for example, if queen f5, knight h6 check, forking king and queen, and the same with queen h5, knight f6 check, forking king and queen. Um, and if queen h4, then g3, uh, where does the queen go? If it goes back now to either d8 or e7, we have queen e5, with the threat of knight f6 check and knight h6 with a mate in two there. Uh, so this is this is absolutely losing for black, uh, this position incredibly. So just with that queen g5, now if uh, queen takes f4, now here uh, g3 is fairly strong and we were looking at that, but there's even stronger actually than g3. But this is pretty strong of the h4 here. So queen the eight and queen e5 were threatening very nasty stuff indeed, and actually winning the exchange because of this threat of knight h6 check and knight f6 check. If the best would seem to be knight g7, then knight f6 check is winning the exchange. There's a clever tactic queen takes rather not winning the exchange, rook and knight for queen, but it's it's still better for white. Uh, so this is all pretty pretty bad after f4 uh, in response to queen uh, g5. But there's an even simpler uh, move which wins after queen takes f4. I wonder if you can spot it in an even simpler way than g3. If I gave you 10 seconds here. Okay, rook f1, it supports um, knight f6 check. So where does the queen go? If it goes to b8, then knight f6 check would seem simple and strong. In fact, a tiny bit more accurate might be queen f2 first, but let's forget that. Knight f6 check, and we just win that exchange. So this is all avoidable with just a very, very careful, precise 
retreat in this position before there's a disaster on f6 with queen d8 which is played queen d8 I think queen e7 might no queen e7 is also pretty diabolical as well so in fact queen d8 is in queen g7 apparently and queen h8 might be but actually queen e7 funny enough is also a total disaster after queen e5 the threat here would be knight h6 jack king moves and uh, queen h8 mate and how does actually black parry this uh, the problem in this position uh, if knight g7 then we just have queen takes e7 so that's that's totally unavailable but in the game continuation what's clever about queen d8 uh, is that um, this is now possible to actually prevent queen e5 because white is actually threatening uh, if white was given another move queen e5 potentially looks uh, dangerous actually no now if white is given another move and plays queen e5 white would lose funny enough um, potentially dangerous is, is giving an heir for the king first let's have a quick look at that in this position queen e5 instructively is actually losing funny enough or nearly losing and it's the game continuation um, now given it's the game continuation let's just go for it so how does black actually parry uh, this this threat of knight f6 check to win the exchange well a very clever move is played knight g7 and you might think well can't white win the exchange with knight f6 check can you see why this loses so knight f6 check would be a terrible blunder here if you had black what would you play in this position okay queen takes f6 there's a nasty back row issue taking on e8 doesn't help the king's got g7 to escape to so if queen takes we get mated but this is actually um, the game continuation is queen e5 it's not not actually losing uh, here uh, for white because after knight g7 there's, there's actually a clever idea which is played in the game so it's so the reason why knight f6 is it's ruled, it's ruled out also knight h6 we should note is is losing actually king f8 he's <laughs> just screwed the queen and rook and there's nothing here for white so in the game there's one move which just secures the draw can you guess what was played okay queen takes e8 funny enough forcing move so if if queen takes we just play knight f6 but if knight takes we just play rook takes e8 so we're getting the queen there drag and drop tactic as I've called it many times in the past queen takes e8 now knight f6 check and we've just got a drawn king and pawn ending unfortunately for the crowds and it was over in about an hour and ten minutes so one of the shortest games <laughs> Now, I really consider this to be the end point of the game at move 28. They tokenly played on a few moves uh, to make the position highly symmetrical. Uh, this is a kind of habit some, some players have, uh, maybe for a bit of amusement when looking at the games after. We see f4, f5, so we've got a purely symmetrical pawn structure, nearly. Uh, the, the pattern would be identical with g3. King f2, b5, b4, king f7, so the kings are exactly opposite h3 h6 h4 h5 and here they finally agree to draw but really uh, the end point of the game must be considered to be king takes e8 at uh, move 28. there seems to be a, an inverse relationship between the importance of games especially in world championship games and how exciting they potentially can be unfortunately so a bit disappointing for chess fans i'm afraid today um, but I hope um, maybe some of you can check out the live commentary. It might actually be more entertaining uh, than, than this video summary here, actually. There was uh, myself, Alex, and uh, Paul, all treble commentary uh, quite early on throughout the, throughout the game. Triple commentary. So, um, okay, until 
Thursday now because tomorrow's a rest day. Uh, Magnus Colson is getting nearer to become the next chess world champion. If Fishy's not going to uh, take too many risks, draws will just spell the end of his reign. It was a very, very fine reign, but um, I think um, it would be a little bit sad if he didn't put up a fight on Thursday with the white pieces. So I'm hoping for a good fight on Thursday. Comments or questions on YouTube? Thanks very much.